Braves and baseball fans, it's time to take a trip from coast to coast across Major League Baseball. There it goes, a long drive. If it stays fair, home run. One strike away. Sandy into his windup. Here's the pitch. Swung out and missed the perfect game. Fly ball deep left center. Grissom on the run. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Atlanta Braves yes. have given you a championship. Listen to this crowd. Left side, Swanson to first. Braves, world champions. Braves in baseball talk. Straight from the diamond. Here's Grant McCauley. And hello and welcome to From the Diamond. I am Grant McCauley. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, live from the Kia Studios in Midtown. Great to be with you on another Sunday evening as we wrap up what was another busy week in spring training for the Atlanta Braves. We get set for another week in our march towards opening day, which is down to about three weeks and a couple of days before the Braves will get the regular season cranked up against the Washington Nationals. That happens on March the 30th. And of course, We'll have you covered all season long right here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game with From the Diamond, and I'll be out at the ballpark and talking to all the Braves, bringing you the sights and sounds of what we hope will be another big season for this team. Got an exciting show lined up for you tonight here on From the Diamond. Make sure you're following along here on Twitter. You can find me at Grant McCauley. You can also find me at Grant McCauley on Instagram. Like the show on Facebook, and you can find all the links you need for that over at FromTheDiamond.com. Braves busy in Grapefruit League play again this weekend. They're going to have a rare off day on Monday. I believe, if I looked at the schedule right, only two off days in spring training. So a lot of uh, baseball to be played, a lot of games to be played, exhibition action, that is. And that means a lot of looks, a lot of opportunity for some Braves that are fighting for roster spots. We're going to hear from a couple of those guys here on this show. One in particular I caught up with down in spring training. We'll get to that in a moment. But as you look through this box score and you start to see batting averages becoming a little more what I'll call Normal for some players. You're not seeing guys batting 800 or batting triple zero anymore. You're starting to see a little bit of that sample size. We always like to talk about in baseball, it is important to have a good sample. And for guys like Von Grissom, uh, guys like Ian Anderson, uh, perhaps in the rotation, uh, Bryce Elder, that's another one. Those are players you're going to want to see, get as many reps in game action as possible. And while I will always say, and uh, underscore, always say, you can kind of look past the numbers to see what the results are on the eye test of how good somebody looks as they get ready for the season. That's more so true for the veterans. That's not true for everybody. So you can't necessarily look at them and say, okay, well, uh, they went an inning and gave up two walks and two homers in the case of Ian Anderson in his spring training debut. But that's okay because he was just working on stuff. Ian even said after that start, I got to get a little bit better. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what was happening on Sunday because Mr. Ian Anderson was in action among others, Charlie Morton got the start against the New York Yankees. I'm going to bury the lead here with the 10-6 loss that the Braves suffered at the hands of the Yankees because this was kind of a tale of two games. It looked awfully good until it didn't, and when it didn't, it was eight runs in the ninth inning against a couple of minor league arms that led to that loss. But overall, I think that you really start to get a feel for what the Braves' opening day lineup could look like. You're really starting to see from some starting pitchers what you need to see from them, and that's just kind of part and parcel to what spring training is. Charlie Morton in this one did give up a solo home run in the first inning. Then he settled down, didn't allow another base runner. Two and two-thirds, a couple of strikeouts for him. Uh, obviously no walks in this one, so Charlie trying to dial things up. Sharpen up, I-, I believe, in a couple of areas where he just didn't really look like the Charlie Morton that we were accustomed to seeing last year. A career high in home runs allowed. Uh, a lot of trouble getting the curveball over for a strike. If he can find ways to you know, just adjust those things and just get back to a little bit more of the Charlie Morton that he's been since 2017, then... If that's your fourth starter, you've got an awfully good starting rotation. And we're going to talk a lot about the starting rotation on this show. Mentioned Ian Anderson also got some work in this one. Two and a third innings for him. He did allow an unearned run, so a little Atlanta miscue behind him that helped lead to that. But only one hit, a couple of walks. Here's what I really wanted to see. Five strikeouts from Ian Anderson in his two and a third innings. He was having a lot of trouble missing bats in that first outing. Gave up a solo home run to start the game. He would issued three two-out walks. Gave up a three-run homer. He just did not look like he had everything dialed up the way he needed to. But as you can look at the numbers and kind of put them off to the side, and what can he work on? What can he improve? Will he find a way to improve? I believe that he did that. And then getting his slider incorporated into that pitch mix, that's going to be a lot of what this spring is about because he needs that viable third pitch, that one that he can count on, 
that he knows exactly what he wants to do with hitters. The fastball command is paramount, but then right after that, slider, changeup, could be a pretty devastating uh, duo of pitches for Ian Anderson. Offensively speaking in this game on Sunday, Matt Olson, uh, hey, he looked great again. That's not surprising. Two for three, his second home run in as many days. Third on the spring, drove in three runs. Austin Riley, another day, another home run for him. He and Matt Olson went back-to-back on Saturday in support of Max Fried as well. I tweeted this out. Again, at Grant McCauley, you can find me there and uh, follow all the Braves tweets. i got a lot coming for you uh, each and every day and, of course, all throughout the year. You might see Matt Olson and Austin Riley in some order go back-to-back quite a few times this season. You might see it quite a few times this decade because those gentlemen are going to be under contract for a long time, and that typically is a good thing for the Atlanta offense, which can be sudden. Travis Darno just got into some Grapefruit League action a few days ago. He was one for two in this game. Uh, Sean Murphy also got a little bit of action on uh, Sunday's game against the New York Yankees. Michael Harris was in action. Eli White has been a guy to take a look at. He's uh, fighting for an outfield spot. Uh, he also has been uh, racking up some base hits, some stolen bases. Could be pretty interesting to monitor him. On Saturday, split squad action. I mentioned Max Fried uh, was on the mound, but so was Spencer Strider. Both men, three scoreless innings, five strikeouts for, uh, for uh, Freed against the Minnesota Twins in a winning effort, and three strikeouts for Spencer Strider in a winning effort against the Baltimore Orioles. So uh, some good things that happened over the weekend, but as I mentioned, we got a lot to talk about, a lot of starting pitching to talk about on this show. We're going to take a deeper look at the Braves' rotation. Also going to hear from Carlos Colazzo of Baseball America. We're going to talk some Braves' prospects on this edition of From the Diamond and a little fantasy baseball with my buddy DJ Short from Roto-Wire. We'll check in with him in the second hour of the show. But coming up, we're going to take a look at the Braves' starting five and one of the strengths of this team. I caught up with Max Fried, Cal Wright, and Colby Allard, an old name, a blast from the past, trying to get a spot in that rotation. You can hear from them next on From the Diamond, right here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Baseball. Talking Braves and beyond. Baseball. With From the Diamond, Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. And welcome back in from the Diamond with Grant McCauley here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, live from the Kia Studios in Midtown as we continue the march toward opening day. We're in the month of March, so appropriately, every day off the calendar, a day closer to regular season baseball, March the 30th, Washington Nationals. But we got a lot to talk about and a lot to preview, I guess, in in the uh, time, the days, the weeks that we have uh, betwixt now and then. And we want to take a special look at every aspect of the Braves team here on the show. That's what I do. That's what we're here for, and we're going to take a deep dive into the rotation. Not just that, I'm going to take you down to Northport, Florida, where I was uh, just over a week ago, spending some time with a lot of members of the 2023 Braves and kind of picking their brains, getting their thoughts as they get ready for a very big season, quite obviously, as Atlanta looks to win the National League East for the sixth consecutive year, and they look to do so on the strength, I think, of their starting rotation, among other things. Yeah, we'll talk about the lineup. We'll talk about the bullpen. Those are both great as well. But as I was mentioning, uh, to open up the show, when you look at the strengths of this club, you have a Cy Young runner-up in Max Fried, who we're about to hear from. You have the uh, Major's only 20-game winner a season ago, Kyle Wright, who you're also going to hear from in just a moment. Then you throw in Spencer Strider, runner-up for National League Rookie of the Year, to his teammate, mind you, Michael Harris, and historically good season for Mr. Strider that could have been, I think, a Rookie of the Year campaign just about any other season that you don't have. I don't know. A Michael Harris running around in center field and doing the things that he was doing. Then you got the veteran Charlie Morton and a nice fifth starters battle that I don't think is quite ready to call yet. Ian Anderson took a step forward on Sunday. Hopefully we're going to get Michael Soroka on a mound, throwing in some exhibition action, and we'll see what Bryce Elder is able to add to this mix among a couple of other maybe dark horse candidates who are looking to at least make an impression because you're not going to get through the season on just five starters no matter how good they are. Uh, The praise, though, they bring that strong rotation into this season, and I looked back at 2022 to see exactly how good this uh, group was. Here are the major league ranks for this team. A 370 ERA was top 10. It was ninth best in baseball. 70 wins by the rotation. I know the pitcher win is not the end-all be-all of pitcher stats, but third most wins by a starting rotation in all of baseball. Second most in strikeouts, 924 of those. They weren't far off the top spot. Then you have to think about Spencer Strider, who was the historical strikeout pitcher of last year, getting over 200 of those in 130 and a third innings. He was in the bullpen for two of those months, so the Braves very well may have had. Uh, the most strikeouts in baseball, Spencer Strider was in the rotation from day one. But, hey, we live, we learn. He was on the roster. He made an impact when they needed him to. A 234 batting average against for the Braves rotation last year, eighth best. Seventh most innings tossed, 890 and a third of those. And as far as wins above replacement, uh, 15.1 was seventh best in baseball. I believe third best in the National League. So any which way you slice it, 
The Braves have a top 10 rotation. I think they've got a top five lineup in baseball, and I think they've got a top five bullpen. So you start to put all those things together, and as you just look at the names there, and you, we talk about you know position battles and you know what the Braves need to determine in spring training, what they need to see from certain players for a couple of spots. This is a well-constructed club with a lot of expectations, both outside the organization and in that clubhouse as well. Max Fried, as I mentioned, runner-up for the National League Cy Young last season, ace of this staff, and he led the Atlanta rotation uh, last year with one of his, if not his, best season to date, and he'll be looking to do it again in 2023. I want to hear from Max Fried because he talked a lot about what this season was for him and, and kind of where he is right now when you consider the larger picture of the Braves, not roster construction, but uh, let's hear from Max Fried talking about his Cy Young runner-up season from a year ago, his second-place finish in that, uh, something that – even he was surprised by. To be completely honest, I don't know if I would have ever thought that I would have even finished that high. It was a you know complete honor. A lot of that's out of my control. It's you know votes, but the one thing that I've constantly tried to do is just go out there and win. And if I go out there and our team has a good chance and we're winning, then you know it probably means I'm doing pretty good too. So it's just for me, it's more focused about team success, and then if some individual stuff comes along with it, then so be with it. But I just kind of go out there and just try to do it for my teammates. The always understated Max Freed. I mean, this guy, you never catch Max Freed on like a roller coaster of emotions. I mean, he's a fiery competitor. You'll see that on the mound. But when you talk to Max Freed, you can't tell if he went seven scoreless innings, struck out 10 yesterday, or maybe he got knocked out in the top of the third inning and he's got to you know go ahead and find a way to refocus. Of course, that second one doesn't happen too terribly often. This guy is, is incredibly good. We talked uh, while we were down in spring training, as we have uh, here on the show, and I'm sure all of you are trying to get used to this whole pitch clock phenomenon that everyone has to deal with. I caught up with Max Reed, and he talked a little bit about what he's doing to adjust to the pitch clock coming to Major League Baseball this year. Never pitch with a pitch clock. It's obviously something that's going to be a learning curve, but I'm excited to get out there for you know just some spring games where there's even just shorter outings just to get a feel of it with the crowd and with things moving around, people on base, of managing the clock and all the other things that kind of go along with it. So it's uh, it's definitely going to be an adjustment, but I'm glad that you know we're going to have a you know a month and a half to be able to figure it out before game start. Yeah, and he's been able to have a couple of starts now. And I posted a video on Twitter that I don't know if went viral is the term, but it got several thousand likes and a lot of plays that. Ronald Acuna Jr. hit a home run off Max Reed in a live BP because Max just looked at the pitch clock and thought, oh, i got to get something off here, got to get it home. And that changeup went over the left center field wall for about 440 feet. Those are the kind of things, though, that you would like to see happen in a live BP or a spring training game so that you know the cadence and the pace that you want to be at in a game in the regular season. And I don't foresee Max Freed or really any other Braves pitcher having that much trouble doing it. But you got to get used to it when you've never done it before and you've been in the game for, as Max was drafted out of high school for over a decade now, dating back to his prospects days, this is going to be a little bit different of an adjustment for him. Now, as we've talked about Max Freed quite a bit and continue to to hear on From the Diamond on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, his contract status may be one of the hot-button talking points, and it could could stay that way, honestly, uh, for the next couple of years. He is under contract for 2023 through arbitration, and again in 2024. So two more years of club control, but if you look around, a lot of guys have signed long-term deals with this Braves club. So Max Fried was asked about uh, how his relationship with the team is right now and uh, if he is open to perhaps signing one of those long-term extensions. I know I've kind of seen that it's been more of a topic of conversation recently, but um, you know, me and the team have always had really good dialogue. We've been able to you know, have some good communication. So um, I've really loved my time here, and you know, I love the team. So if that you know, comes to the table, then it'll be something that you know, we think about. That Max Freed is the Braves player rep, so you know he's kind of got his finger on the pulse of a lot of the different things that uh, each and every player is going to be concerned about when it comes to collective bargaining and all of the different things that kind of go into the ins and outs of managing that side of things. So I think he has a really unique perspective of exactly what you'd kind of want to focus on in, in those kinds of talks. But don't let it get lost uh, for one moment that – Max is not only happy to be with the Atlanta Braves, he's also happy for his teammates that have had that opportunity, the young players on this club, to sign those long-term extensions. Here's Max discussing that and a little bit about that arbitration that a lot of folks thought might be driving a wedge between he and the Braves. All those things, I couldn't be happier. I mean, to first comment on the other people, I, I couldn't be happier for them. You know, they, they've worked really hard and they've earned it and they're extremely talented. And, you know, I was going up, giving them hugs and sitting in their press conferences and it was... You know, it's kind of life-changing money for people. So it's being able to just, like, congratulate them and support them. And, you know, we're teammates at the end of the day. Um, But, you know, it's not – on my side, there's no 
anger or animosity or anything. It's, it's two sides going at it and business and just kind of the way I see it. Yeah, that little bit about the arbitration case that, you know, Max Fried filed for a certain number, the Braves filed for a certain number. They were not unable to agree. They go to an arbitration hearing. The arbiter at that point, he doesn't split the difference. He picks one or the other side. It's it's worth noting, though, that I believe Freed on Major League Baseball trade rumors was, um, I think, in line for a 12 and a half projection, $12.5 million salary projection this year. He beat that. He just did not beat the Braves in the salary arbitration numbers exchange, but still doing pretty well for himself at over $13 million here for the upcoming season. Now, I caught up with Max Freed after his media scrum to ask him a couple of other questions. And one thing I'd been wanting to know for a couple of years how exactly the presence of Cole Hamels influenced Max Freed. Now, you might be thinking, Cole Hamels, he was here for, what, half a season? Yes, he was. He threw three and two-thirds innings, I think, in a Braves uniform. But when you think about Cole Hamels and the similarities between another young left-hander, somebody looking to really establish himself at the big league level, there is a lot that can be learned from that. So here's my conversation with Max Freed from Braves Spring Training last week. He was a guy that I saw a lot of myself in as far as just being, you know, left-handed, thinner build, pitchability, and someone that's done it at a high level. And I think that we kind of just clicked immediately. And even to this day, he's always been supportive and, you know, reach out and we talk and kind of converse. But he he was someone that during a transitional period of me being like a full-time starter and then gaining that confidence in myself injected a lot of confidence into me that that was really needed at the time. And I remember even even when he wasn't playing or you know he wasn't you know around the team as much as he was he was doing little things that were still extremely valuable to my development i remember that he would invite us over because we weren't allowed to be at the field he would invite us over for dinner and to watch the game and just be able to have more personal time and get to know him as a person and also have those conversations and then being able to have that where we go through you know the playoffs and different things like that where he was always available and always accessible and if I needed questions or anything that he was he was always happy to help and he was definitely a really really big kind of catalyst for me to be able to take off and just come into my own as a player. Yeah, I know a lot of us, whether it's media types, fans, just people who are kind of outside the game, outside the clubhouse on a regular basis, you know, we can say, hey, having this veteran player means a lot to the club, not just what they bring on the field, but the things that they do off of the field. A guy like Charlie, obviously Lockhart next to you, you talked about this a little bit Absolutely. earlier. How much is that influence truly felt by younger pitchers, younger players, just the whole team dynamic? I don't think you can really put a true value to it because if you have a good veteran player that's – open and willing to share their experience with the younger guy it just takes a lot of the learning just like the learning bumps and bruises out of it where they can help you out and say like hey I did this earlier in my career and it didn't work you should try doing this and if you have enough of that you have less of the growing pains and less of the failure experiences because you've got someone that can be like no like this is what I've done like let me show you how to do it more efficiently. And I think that's what everyone's trying to do is just find out how what works for them in their routine the most efficient and best way possible and being able to have people that have kind of been there, done that in your position and in your shoes is a really good way of just kind of becoming the best player that you can that much quicker. Yeah. i ask you a little bit about the guys coming up together. I mean, you pitched in rotations with a lot of these guys throughout mm-hmm. your time as a prospect and making your way into the big leagues. Each one of you does have your own style. How much does that make this rotation perhaps a little bit better because other teams know they're going to get five different looks when you go turn through this rotation? I think it's a really important thing because you know, no two guys look even remotely similar, kind of like what you just said. So when you have to come in every single day and see someone that looks a little different, it's just going to make it that much harder on the hitter. You don't want to give them the same look too many times. So I think we do a really good job of having enough you know, variety that's just going to be in our benefit. And I know these guys are chomping at the bit to get out there. Yeah, everyone's excited to get out there, get those innings in, and get ready for opening day. One man who's on his way through, as you just heard from Max Freed here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, my conversation with him from down in Northport about a week or so ago. Uh, one guy who's looking to get into that game action, it should be pretty soon, is Kyle Wright. Now, he had a cortisone shot in his throwing shoulder in January, but I was able to catch up with him, talk to him about just, I guess, the overall big picture look at 2023. It's the first year he hasn't had to come to spring fighting for a job. So 
Here's my conversation with Kyle Wright, the Major League's only 20-game winner last year. Spring training 2023, I'm guessing is going to feel a lot different than spring training 2022 because this is a completely different circumstance. The year that you had last year, what's the mindset coming into this spring training? I know you've been able to establish yourself, but I would imagine that continuing to go down that path is probably top of mind. Yeah, you know, I think one, you kind of look at spring a little bit differently. You know, fortunate enough to I can kind of use spring to really get ready instead of having to come in and compete right away. Not that that's going to really change too much because I still want to compete. That's the goal is, you know, one of the best things my college coach ever taught us about baseball was positions are rented, not earned. So I think that was one of the best pieces of advice I ever got. And so even though, you know, like I said, I had a great year, put myself in a good position this year, but like I said, if you don't perform, everything's rented. So um, I think for me, I want to just make sure I use this time to prepare properly, make sure I stay strong. Because again, I want to be as good as I am from the start to the finish. I think for me, just making sure that I'm doing things I need to do, continue to work on the things I want to work on. And um, you know, I feel like I had a good year last year, but I feel like I still left a lot of things on the table. Um, there's a couple starts that just got away from me. And you know, I feel like if I could have done this, could have done that, then could have been even different. So I still feel like there's a lot that I can grow on from last year, but obviously, you know, learned a lot and had a lot of success and, you know, want to try to keep that rolling. I talked to Max a little bit yesterday about the difference in styles of the guys that are in this rotation and obviously the guys that could join this rotation at some point this year. Do you feel like that's something that gives this club an advantage with so many different styles and looks from the starting pitchers? I think so, because as an opposing team, if you're having to face a different kind of pitcher every night, then that's tough. It's really, every pitcher is different regardless of similarities, but I think the more different looks you can give a team, the tougher it is. And to Max's point, we have a lot of different looks that we give guys, guys that throw hard, guys that can sink it, guys that can, you know, uh, spin it. So I think that just gives us another pretty big element to our team and our staff. And so I mean, we got a lot of talent, and it'll be exciting to see everyone perform this year. And one of the unique things about this rotation is you guys grew up in this organization together. As you look at the fifth spot of the rotation, I mean, I guess a year ago, there were a couple of spots that were up for grabs. You were yeah. able to secure one of those. And what's the outlook as you see guys that you know really well, like Ian, like Mike, like Bryce, just try to battle it out for that spot? Yeah, you know, it's just one of those things where you just kind of have to run your own race. And I think for me personally things that i learned is in years past sometimes i tried to you know i would look too much in that and i got ahead of myself and i didn't really use spring to prepare the way i needed to for me last year was probably my best spring and you know i think the reason i was able to make the team and have a good year is because i finally you know said what do i need to do well to succeed and excel and not worry so much about winning this winning that you know that's at the end of the day that's out of our control anyway so I think that was the biggest thing for me, and I think that's what those guys need to do is just know who they are as a pitcher and continue to work on that and just go be them. And, you know, like I said, everybody's so talented, and um, we're going to need everyone to do what we want to do anyway. So I think it's just important to know that everyone's going to run their own race and um, just be them. You got a couple of guys in here, Charlie Morton and Jesse Chavez. This is their 20th spring training. These guys got started way back in 2002. I've talked a little bit about veteran leadership with a few different players because I think from the outside of the clubhouse, we might perceive all of that differently. But as somebody who's alongside these guys, working in rotation or just on a pitching staff with them, how valuable is it to have guys with that kind of experience? Yeah, it's crazy that they've, you know, 20th spring training. But, um, yeah, those guys, are they're invaluable, like you said. Just so much experience, and they've been around the game a long time. And you just notice that the way they play the game, it just seems a lot slower. Um, the game never speeds up on them, regardless of the situation, the outcome. Uh, if they have a bad outing, you wouldn't know it. If they had a good outing, you would never know it. And I think that's why they've been able to be successful for so long. Um, and I think that's something that we can really learn from those guys, and that's something I've tried to learn from those guys. And that's what helped me last year, has being able to move on from outing to outing, because there was times last year where I had a bad start, and in years past, it probably would have turned into another bad start, another bad start. But um, last year, I was able to move on, and learn what I needed to learn and you know, I think that's a testament to those guys you see how they prepare and how they handle themselves and um, that's huge it's really important to have guys like that on the team and um, you know it's not just their experience they bring they're obviously really talented pitchers um Charlie's still throwing 97 and which is insane that he's doing that and you know Chavi's command is unlike anyone's I've ever seen and that's why he's been so successful so um, those guys are really important pieces to this team appreciate the time good luck with everything this spring and talk to you soon absolutely thanks man That was Braves pitcher Kyle Wright. My visit with him from spring training last week. Just great to catch up with him, catch up with Max Freed, caught up with a lot of the different starting pitchers on this staff because, again, this is going to be one of the strengths of this club, no question 
2023. Meanwhile, one of the strengths for the Braves for a long time has been the farm system. We saw it again last year in maybe un- improbable fashion with what Spencer Strider and, of course, Michael Harris did. But I want to talk with Carlos Colazzo, my buddy from Baseball America. Take a look down on the farm and size up where that system is these days. That's coming your way next right here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. place for all things MLB and our Braves. This is From the Diamond on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Welcome back to From the Diamond with Grant McCauley right here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. We talked a lot about the spring training action that's happening right now, the battles in big league camp, but in this camp also are a lot of hopefuls that are looking to leave their mark, maybe make this team, in some cases, some minor league players, some Braves prospects, something we always like to take a look at here on the show as well. To help me do that, I want to invite in my friend Carlos Colasso of Baseball America. He covers the Braves, does their top 30 prospects, also covers the draft for Baseball America. You can follow him on Twitter at Carlos A. Colasso. Well, Carlos, appreciate you making some time to join me, and I'm excited to talk Braves prospects with you. It's been a minute. Yeah, it has. Thanks for having me on here. It's always fun to talk prospects. Uh, the Braves have been a fun organization over the last few years. Obviously, it was cool to hang out with you uh, that summer back in 2015 when I was actually covering the Braves uh, as an intern. Uh, so, yeah, excited to do this. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. As we talked about the Braves and you look at this club and you go position by position, there's so much homegrown talent. And then you can also look at players that they acquired when they were still in their minor league years in the case of the rebuild. So let's dive in here to this year because it's safe to say the Braves farm system has done its job over the past few years, really even longer than that. The decade of the 2020s appears to be in good hands and very well built when you're able to throw in the extensions on top of you know, drafting, producing, signing that talent, and getting it to the mm-hmm. big league level through development. Now, last year, the Braves tumbled in those rankings. Michael Harris II, mm-hmm. who you brought up, Spencer Strider, who you also brought up, they became household names and, and made contributions in a crazy NLE's comeback for the Braves, who marched back from 10 and a half games behind the Mets at one point to win the division. It surprised me to see this happen for both of these guys, the success that they found last year so quickly. Did it surprise you? (laughs) Well, definitely with Spencer Strider. And in hindsight, he's a guy that I wish we had a little bit higher on our list. With Michael Harris, I think just how quickly he was able to come up through the minors and to be the sort of all-star caliber player. I mean, his rookie year was one of the best we've seen. If you prorate his season over a full year in terms of what he did, it stands up with some of the best rookie debuts that we've seen in years. So, I knew the talent was there with Harris. I think I was more confident in his talent translating to the bigs than Strider. I think at the time with Strider, I was concerned about starter reliever role. I know a lot of scouts that I talked to wondered if the two pitch mix would work in a starter capacity. That was always the big question. And I think Strider has shown that when you have two elite, elite pitches, I think his fastball is maybe the best fastball in the game and certainly a top five fastball if it's not the best. Uh, His slider, again, I think same category there. When your top two pitches are that good, clearly you can have success without going into a third pitch or a fourth pitch as a starter. But yeah, both those guys were tremendous. With Harris, it was interesting because at the time that we ranked Harris the number one prospect entering the 2022 season, there are questions about whether or not Shea Langoliers and Christian Pache, those were the top three guys who mm-hmm. we were really trying to decide who was the number one. There are good cases for all three of them at the time, even if it might seem crazy now to think about that, but we ended up going with Harris just because of the conviction and his pure hitting ability, yeah. I think was a little bit ahead of, of his Shea Langoliers and a Christian Pache. He showed the hitting ability, he showed the speed, he showed power, he showed amazing defense in center field. So it's really just a great turnout for both those players. Yeah, it certainly was. And as you look at the list, those top three guys, and it is funny to think about where you can be even just year to year, how much that can change. The Braves were nice enough to do that thing you alluded to earlier and trade away the correct prospects and keep the right prospect. And if there was any question about who was number one out of those three guys after the Matt Olson trade, well, Michael Harris was the last man standing. And as it turned out, he was the right guy to have at the top of that list for a multitude of reasons. Talking to Carlos Colazzo of Baseball America here on 92.9 The Game from the Diamond with Grant McCauley. Make sure you're following Carlos on Twitter at Carlos A. Colazzo. He's also covering the draft for Baseball America. A lot of great Braves coverage as well as he is in charge of the top prospects list. And that's what we're talking about here today. Now, the Braves find themselves right now at or near the bottom of virtually every prospect ranking system that you'll find for 2023. 
I don't think that that's a big surprise. And even with the the crazy meteoric rise of the Michael Harris's and Spencer Striders of the world last year, that notwithstanding, what did you find when you started evaluating the system this year? And how much do you think that overall ranking can or will change over the upcoming weeks, months, and maybe the next year or so? Yeah, I think when we started digging into the system very quickly, we realized that it wasn't great. And I think especially in contrast to some of the systems it's had in the past, even in the last few years, it's been a solid system just in terms of players in the top 10, even if the depth was maybe a little bit handicapped because of some international sanctions that the Braves had to go through. All of that played a part. This past year, the graduations really took a toll. And that's that's how you want your system to fall down the farm rankings. Like no one is no one is wanting a number one farm system in the game because that means your big league team has probably not been in a good spot for a while. Right. So the Braves are last and I think they were far and away the easy choice to be the number 30 team on our farm system rankings. But if you look at what they've produced, it would be a lot tougher if you're a team like the Tigers or the Royals, who we also have far down in our farm system rankings, but haven't had the big league success and haven't established the core. So I think for the Braves specifically right now, there are still a few pitchers that I think can impact the team this year who are in the top 10. Jared Schuster is one, mm-hmm. uh, Darius Vines, Dylan Dodd, all those guys. It wouldn't shock me if they performed well and had some sort of impact on the big league team. Once you get past those names, it's a lot of volatile, high upside, high risk high school pitchers. And I think maybe the biggest thing that stands out about the system as it stands right now is there's just not a lot of bats that you can have a lot of confidence in. There are some interesting hitters at the lower levels. Uh, But in terms of guys who are at the upper levels, they've either been traded away. Justin Henry Malloy was an interesting name who I think could have maybe had an impact on the team, given Mm -hmm. his left field profile and the hole the Braves have there. Uh, He was traded away, obviously. So there's not one hitter that you can point to and be very confident that they're going to be an everyday player. I think that's the biggest question for the Braves moving forward is who's going to step into that role if there is someone in the system now. And if not... Uh, who do they target in the draft or an international free agency in the future that will kind of help refill the hitting of the system? Carlos Colazo of Baseball America joining me here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. I was going to save the international stuff for a little bit later, but since you brought it up, I kind of want to jump into it right now because for several years, we really couldn't talk about international prospects for the Atlanta Braves because they couldn't Mm -hmm. make any international signings. I think it's safe to say that that multiple year signing ban was easily worse than the initial prospects that the Braves were stripped of when MLB dropped the hammer on them. Just how much of an impact does that make on any club when you can't sign international Mm -hmm. players in this game for multiple years? Yeah, I think it's massively impactful. I mean, clearly all the players who were stripped from the system didn't really pan out, but I think the the ability to just throw darts, uh, scratch a lottery ticket for players like this really helps. Uh, Even if you're not hitting at a high rate, and and I think this is true of prospects in general, not necessarily just the international players, um, but having that uh, acquisition source just be taken away means you're only filling in the draft. Um, It means you you just don't have an area of talent where you can go after high upside athletic, really exciting players. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of if you're talking about a window of players kind of moving up those years where the Braves could have had international prospects developing, we might've been in a situation where there are still uh, a lot more solid players at the mid to upper levels of the Mm -hmm. minors at this point. So I think it just kind of, you want consistent waves of talent coming through your system. And it certainly hurt the Braves in that regard. I think they've probably, managed to mitigate that problem because of the massive success they had with players who were on the big league team. Um, But it still means that it might take a little bit longer before you get that next wave. Luis Guanipa sounds very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, But I think with all these international prospects, you have to wait a while before you really have any certainty. We've heard of so many players who have been massively hyped up, haven't met expectations, players who didn't have many expectations at all and, and suddenly jumped on the scene and really performed. So There are a few interesting names that I'm excited to kind of monitor their progress, uh, but it's very hard to say if there's an impact player uh, that the Braves have acquired in the last two years in the international market right now. Yeah, but at least now they have the opportunity to have that door open to them and to have that part of their talent pipeline once again, perhaps being able to contribute to taking a team that is at the bottom of the prospect rankings and maybe pushing them back up toward the bottom third or maybe even into the middle just by the pure numbers. And like you said, having the opportunity to scratch that lottery ticket and see if you really do find one of those exciting talents. The Braves have done it before. They'd like to do it again. Uh, Talking about some of the pitching that they have developed, that, of course, typically seems to come from the draft. Jared Schuster was a top pick for the Braves a number of years ago, but he has now risen to AAA as of last year. 
There's some questions at the number five spot in the rotation for the Braves that they're going to try to answer this spring and, of course, at some point this season. Do you see Schuster as a viable candidate to get that spot this year? With Kyle Muller gone, he seems to be the most major league-ready arm that the Braves have. Yeah, that seems like the case. I think Schuster, Dylan Dodd are both really interesting, but Schuster performed well in the upper minors last year. I think there was uh, some question about how many whiffs he was going to get at the next level, or I should say at higher levels of the minors, not the next level, but he doesn't have the sort of power in his stuff that maybe you're looking at. I don't know what the overall upside will be with him, but he's a very polished pitcher overall. I think even though the fastball velocity is more average and the fastball overall is more average, the changeup could still potentially be an out pitch. We have it as a 60 grade pitch. Uh, he has good control. The walk rate of just 6.8% over his minor league career is impressive. Yeah. Um, so I do think he's a guy who, who you can kind of put in the rotation feel confident that he's going to give you solid innings and keep you competitive in the game. It's interesting with Schuster too, because he went in the first round and part of the reason he went that high is because he showed a velocity spike in that shortened 2020 draft. We never have really seen that since he's been in pro ball. And I wonder if it's just a case of the workload in pro ball and being more extended. And it was only a few weeks where he showed that velocity spike, but we've seen it in the past enough. That makes me wonder, does he kind of rediscover that? And if he does, I think that that ups the, impact that he could have in a rotation but i think even if that doesn't happen you're looking at a very reliable back of the rotation arm and while that might not be the sexiest profile i think it's still pretty valuable yeah you mentioned the name a couple of times i want to bring him up here because i just got to lay eyes on him in spring training and that is dylan dodd and there is a i think a lot to like there i watched him on the backfields yeah. punch out some big league hitters including ronald acuna jr in a live bp session that will get one's attention in the first week of spring training. Uh, while Schuster mm -hmm. may have gotten a little bit more AAA time last year, Dodd did get to at least punch his ticket to Gwinnett. It was there at the very, very end of the year. But it feels like by getting an invite to spring camp and having the opportunity to showcase his skills, Dylan Dodd, if you don't already know him, could be on the Braves' radar and could be on fans' radar at some point in 2023 and might be knocking on the door of a big league promotion. Yeah, Dodd was one of the players that I came away most uh, impressed with and I was probably most surprised about what I was hearing about him when we went through this process of ranking players. Uh, I think going into the process, he was just kind of another name. And very quickly after talking to people, uh, both, both people within the Brave system and, and scouts who were evaluating it from other teams, he was a name that people were like, yeah, you need to get him up the list. He's been very impressive. I think similar to Schuster, he's not a player who's going to overpower you with stuff. I, I'm actually not sure what he's been throwing this spring so far, but Last year, it was mostly low 90s fastball, touching a 95, mm -hmm. um, decent carry. But what stands out about Dodd is his ability to um, mix pitches, attack the zone wherever he wants, use the fastball, uh, up, down, in and out, set up the changeup, set up the slider, both of which are solid secondary pitches. I think you can make a case that he has the best control in the system. Uh, now, he does just have 53 innings in the upper minors, which is a question – but I do think he's shown enough polish and enough success at that level that if there's an injury, if there's an opening, he would be another name that I would look forward to seeing how he does at the big league level. Because I think there are always some questions with players like this, like Dodd, like Schuster. Mm -hmm. If they go to the big leagues, is the lack of stuff going to really just not, not allow them to take that step? So that's a question for both of these guys. But in terms of feel for pitching, uh, command, pitch mix, I, I think they're – they're going to be fun pitchers to watch, and I think they could be reliable back-end arms. Yeah, the Braves have a very good thing going in the rotation with Max Freed, Kyle Wright, Charlie Morton, Spencer Strider, and whatever order you want to throw them out there, they have to feel good about yep. four of those spots. They have Ian Anderson. Hopefully at some point Michael Soroka gets healthy, gets to jump back into this mix as well. And Bryce Elder mm -hmm. showed the Braves a little bit last year as well. You talked about those graduations. He's another guy on that list that Atlanta's at least intrigued by it as a rotational depth in addition to the mm -hmm. Jared Schusters and Dylan Dodds and whoever it may be. Wrapping up here with Carlos Colazzo of Baseball America, you know, as we talk about pitching a lot with the Braves, it seems to go hand in hand synonymous if you're going to talk about Braves prospects you're going to talk about pitching and they're always yeah. adding it in the draft we saw it as recently as last year it's pretty apparent in their top 10 on the Baseball America list who else do you have your eye on from recent classes just names that they may be in the lower minors they, they may have just mm -hmm. been drafted last June that uh, should be guys that Braves fans should keep in the back of their minds as they make that trek through the minor leagues and hopefully reach Atlanta one day yeah I think this guy is already a bit has a bit of a cult following among Braves fandom and that's Ignacio Alvarez uh, or Nacho Alvarez Yes. which is his nickname, which is a just a great nickname overall. But he was a guy in the draft who 
we didn't know a ton about. I think the Braves were one of the highest orgs on him. That makes sense, uh, considering they signed him to a decent bonus, 500000 mm-hmm. in the fifth round. Uh, very quickly after he was selected, we were kind of scrambling to get some information on him. Braves, the Braves really liked his strike zone discipline at the plate. He walked 36 times compared to just 16 strikeouts. Yeah, and good. it was Juco competition, so I think, yeah, very good. It was Juco competition, so I think there were some hesitancy about how that would um, translate to professional ball. But he had his pro debut, and it was very impressive. The walk rate was 21%. The strikeout rate was just 12%. The chase rate was among the lowest of all the Braves hitters uh, in, in the system. So because of that, because of his just kind of savvy eye at the plate, high contact rates, he got some, and I think this is probably just an easy comparison because they're players from the same system. He got some Von Grissom comparisons in terms of being a very polished hitter, but one who needed to learn how to elevate a little bit more often in the mm-hmm. future to tap into some more game power. So if he is able to follow that, that Von Grissom route, that's really exciting. And I think, even outside of the bat, the defensive ability is impressive as well. I mean, he's got a chance to be an above average defender at third base. He was even good enough as a defender that he got some time at shortstop. So I think at the same time, he's a more advanced defender than Von Grissom is. The question now is once he starts playing against upper level pitchers, once he moves up in the system, what really are we looking at with the bat? Because I think given his previous competition, given a small sample in low minors, there there is st- still some skepticism as to what the hit tool and what the power really is going to be. But there are a lot of really intriguing traits. And I'm pretty tired of the Braves taking a lower draft player and him popping and us uh, just <laughs> playing catch up. So I, right. I kind of trust them with all these guys at this point. You should always uh, trust the Braves to their picks, given what they've done the last few years. Yeah, it does seem like they have the inside track on some players and some names that you mm-hmm. may not know initially, at least with a lot of the pre-draft hype or even the international signing hype. And then all of a sudden, they have found themselves kind of a, I don't even want to call it a diamond in the rough, because who knew? But the Braves seem to know. Yeah. But he's Carlos Colazo of Baseball America. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, at Carlos A. Colazzo. As always, enjoyed talking Braves prospects with you. I look forward to doing it again sooner than later. Yeah, thanks, Grant. Thanks for having me. This was fun. All right, thanks to Carlos for a great Great chat about Atlanta Braves prospects. You should be keeping your eye on this spring. And don't go anywhere. We've got a lot more Braves talk coming your way right here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Now, back to more From the Diamond, Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. And welcome back in. Grant McCauley here on From the Diamond. Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, live from the Kia Studios. Hope you are having a great weekend. Thanks for wrapping it up with me here on another Sunday evening. You can catch From the Diamond right here on The Game each and every Sunday. And then, of course, you can find it wherever you get your podcasts, also on the Odyssey app. Just search for From the Diamond wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Also, if you want links to all the social articles and anything else I got for you, fromthediamond.com is the place to find that. Let's start hour two by taking another look at a very important position for the Atlanta Braves because, as I talked about in the first hour of the show, starting pitching, that's been the foundation. You think about the Atlanta Braves, especially if you grew up like I did, a child of the 80s turned into the 1990s when you had that nice three-headed monster with three Hall of Famers fronting your rotation. You always think about the Braves and great starting pitching. They got away from that for a little while. They would have you know, the occasional arm that would really pop and somebody that would really come in and – and, and give you the innings that you needed, whether it be a, a Tim Hudson or even a Julio Tehran for a little while, but it's a little fewer and further between. But now all of a sudden, I think we're kind of in like another great age of, of young, uh, successful, brave starting pitchers led by Max Freed, but then Kyle Wright comes into his own last year. Spencer Strider explodes onto the scene. you still got Charlie Morton in tow, and you've got a lot of guys, I think, that could really line up to help you out in the fifth spot of the rotation. But in charge of all of that or in partnership with all of that, you really want to know that you can trust the guy that they're going to be going to battle with, the guy that's going to be throwing down the signs, the guy that's going to be trying to lead them through this whole pitch clock and pace of play business we're going to be dealing with in 2023 and beyond. And that, of course, is the Atlanta catching core. And I, it's, I know not a place that people went into the offseason thinking, gosh, the Braves better get better at catcher. You look at what they got from uh, two All-Stars last year. I mean, William Contreras got in as kind of a DH All-Star. Bryce Harper was injured. But either way, William Contreras, offensively speaking, even defensively speaking, he stepped up and played a big role on the Braves in 2022. And I think a lot of people, justifiably, were excited about seeing what he was going to do in the years to come. Well, you get into the offseason, and it's, you know, William Contreras is part of a big three-team trade, and Sean Murphy, a gold glover from the Oakland Athletics, comes over 
And that really changed the whole perspective. And in the background of all of this is the veteran incumbent and all-star himself and Travis Darno, who was having one of the best seasons of his career and now is going to be in tandem with another very talented catcher. And the Braves have really, I think, uh, tapped into something that could be one of the most important parts of all these rules changes that we're seeing, and that's taking a defensive approach. I mean, they're going to get some offense from these guys, but the defensive premium that you get from uh, Sean Murphy, I think, is going to make a huge impact on the 2023 season. So I want to start uh, with Travis Darno, though, as we go into a little bit of a player preview. And I started this series on the podcast about a month, month and a half ago, but I kind of wanted to bring it in here just because, A, you got a lot of people listening to the show, perhaps for the first time, and then B, because I think it's the kind of thing that folks who tune into this show are really looking for, and that's not just to hear the Braves talked about, but it's to hear from the Atlanta Braves. That's one of the things we're here to do on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley. So in this player preview series, I had a chance at a Fan Fest, at Spring Training, wherever it may be, to hear from some of these guys, and I want to put together some of the, the best of the best sounds as we get started with the 2023 season. And Travis Darno, who will be joined by Sean Murphy this year, with those two in harness handling this pitching staff, plus the offensive upside that I think this built into both of those guys, the Braves might just have the best catching in the majors this season. I would think maybe the Toronto Blue Jays have a, a stake to claim there, but otherwise it's going to be, I think, a, a very big chasm between those top two catching uh, pro- productivities, whether you want to call it you know, offensively, defensively, whatever it is. I think that the Braves are going to be tops in the National League. Let's call it that. Not a bold prediction. Just any old prediction. That's what I'm going to call it. But Travis told us that he heard from Alex Anthopoulos immediately after the Braves trading for Sean Murphy, which was, again, a surprising move for many, if not most. It showed me that he respects me and how I think and my thought process and wanted to make sure that we were on the same page before it all got released, which is something that you hope for in every GM or every owner even. And for me to get that was special, and I didn't expect it, and I felt very grateful that he, he let me know before everybody else found out. Darno's excited about the arrival of Murphy and understands that this move can have a ripple effect on the lineup and, of course, the workload behind the plate, and that's something Darno certainly welcomes. I would say it's very beneficial. There's an old saying, two heads are better than one, especially when one of them's a gold glover. That It's special. It's, it's going to be big, especially in September and October. Both of us will feel fresh, which will... Help us not only behind the plate, but at the plate, I believe. Major League Baseball was busy over the winter, coming up with some new rules that will change the way the game is played, with a major part of the focus being on speeding the game up with a pitch clock and changing the way that runners are held, and perhaps the role that the stolen base will play in the game moving forward. It's new for me. It's new for everybody. I think in spring we'll kind of experiment and talk and figure out what's best for each individual more so than as a, a collective group. I don't know the exact rules. There's a lot of little things that not all of us are exactly sure about. I know in the minors it worked well and sped up the games, which isn't a bad thing, I would say. Sometimes three and a half hour games can be long. Uh, But at the same time, it'll be interesting when it's the seventh, eighth, and ninth, and you're only up by one, and there's a runner on third, and you have to worry about being fast or quick, whatever the term is. It'll be interesting and something it's kind of a, you learn just facing it head on and going through the fire and learning through failure, kind of like how baseball is in general. It'll be new and it'll be fun, and we're all looking forward to try to figure out how to do this thing. In addition to the pitch clock, which is going to make pitchers much more focused on the batter and have to work much more quickly, the runners being held on will no longer be subject to throw after throw over to first base. A pitcher will be able to throw over twice. If he throws over a third time, he either picks the runner off or a balk is called. That's going to be an interesting caveat, and I'm sure we're going to see it in action for better or for worse. Major League Baseball also changed the size of the bases, making them a little bit larger, which many people believe will aid in stolen base attempts. Despite being the man tasked with throwing out all these would-be base dealers, Travis Darno is excited to kind of turn back the clock and bring some speed back into the game. Yeah, it'll be fun. It's bringing back a part of the game, I think, that's disappeared over the last five to ten years. You know, Growing up, you saw a lot more of stolen bases, a lot more balls in play, a lot more hit and runs, and it seems like the game's trending back towards that. So it's just a little different game planning going into the game. You kind of know who the runners are if you pick three times, but they have to be out. Um, from what I've heard, too, is the hitters uh, having two picks, and if you've done one, that runners don't really know. And then the it's not 90 feet to second base anymore, right? The bases are bigger, so it's like 89 feet, 11 inches and a half or something. 
you know, it's different. It's new. It's just something we'll have to adapt to. Now, outside of the rules changes, which we'll be watching in 2023, one thing we can expect is for the Braves to have a battle on their hands in the National League East. While Atlanta and the New York Mets each won 101 games, both of them were sitting on their couch watching the Philadelphia Phillies make it to the World Series. The Phillies knocked the Braves out in the division series en route to the NL pennant. Having such a great regular season only to have a short run in October is something Travis Darno said will be motivating this team as they get to work on 2023. Oh yeah, definitely. Especially against a division rival. Nobody wants to go home in the our first round. I think it leaves a bitter taste on everybody's tongue to be motivated. And now we know that they're a great team and especially in playoffs time, they were phenomenal. I actually thought that they were going to win it all. They were so hot. And I know in playoffs, it's more about who's hot and than who's the better team. So yeah, I think we all got extra motivation and are, are ready to get this thing going. As for this division, not only were there two 100-win teams and the National League champion, but all of them were making moves over the course of the winter, perhaps none more so than the New York Mets, but the Phillies, they were also busy, and both clubs were spending a lot of money. One of the big reasons they had to do that is to try to catch up, keep pace, or outpace the Atlanta Braves. That is something that no NLE's team has been able to do since back in 2017. While the pass won't necessarily help the Braves out, it's been a pretty good indicator of what we can expect out of this club in 2023. And Darno said he is expecting a battle for the NL East crown. New York has obviously signed Verlander. DeGrom's not there. Philly has Trey Turner now. They both are great teams. Yeah, they, they've been making some big moves, and they're going to be good. They're going to be really good, and it'll be a battle till the end. I know we only play them 14 times now because we have to play everybody. I don't know if that changes anything, of, but now there's – Three big-headed monsters. Well, that's Travis Darno, the Braves all-star catcher, talking about what is, uh, I'm sure, going to be a battle in the National League East. You think about the money that was spent uh, not only by the New York Mets but also by the Philadelphia Phillies and the fact that the Braves, well, they're already built to win. I don't think that's going to surprise anyone. They're not going to sneak up on anyone or have to sneak up on anyone. They're going to be the hunted once again. And you consider what happened in the second half last year, it's hard not to feel like the Braves should be at least a – if not the heavy favorite, that they should have perhaps the inside track. And for the first time, and I can't remember when, projections were actually pretty kind to the Atlanta Braves when it comes to that as well. But projections are just that. It's an idea, maybe an indicator of how the season may look, but it's far from a guarantee, that's for sure. Now, Travis Darno is going to be sharing his time with Sean Murphy, who came over in that big trade, the Braves parting with a bunch of prospects and William Contreras, in order to get one of, if not the best catchers in all of baseball, in Murphy. Now, he was traded over on December the 12th, and that was one of the first calls he got, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, was from the man he's going to be splitting time with, Travis Darno. And Murphy said that that call in and of itself meant a lot to him. That means a lot. I don't know if I said this before, but he was one of the first people to reach out after the trade. I don't know how he got my number so quick, but, you know, the trade was announced, and I think he might have been one of the first two people to call me and just say, what's up, how's it going? We're excited to get started, and uh, – and work together. Just like Darno, Murphy's going to be spending a good portion of spring training getting used to the new rules that MLB's thrown out there, which we'll get to in a moment. Unlike Darno, Murphy's going to spend time getting used to new teammates. Among those is Kyle Wright, who he had a chance to work with in his offseason home of Nashville. That yeah, was great, you know, just to meet him. And then one weekend I get traded, I come back in Monday, he's like, oh, what's up, teammate? Like, you know, so uh, I guess one of those small world things, I don't know, but. Uh, it's good. I get to see it. he's got a great work ethic and, uh, you know, I'm excited to start catching him off the mound here soon. Kyle Wright is not the only man that Murphy's going to be familiar with walking into the Braves clubhouse at spring training. One man in particular is Matt Olson, who he spent his first three seasons with out in Oakland. Olson was asked to talk about being Murphy's teammate and what his impression of him is as a catcher and provided this gem of a story from Murphy's rookie season of 2019. For whatever reason pops in my head, I just picture Murph when he first came up as like a 23, 24-year-old guy, and he's in spring training every day, like one of the first guys, just like a 40-year-old man, like sitting there with his crossword and like his analytic stuff, drinking a coffee. He's like, like is, this, is this kid like 23 or what? But that's kind of how he is. Like he's got his regiments, he's studious, he does his right thing. He goes out and he balls. No doubt the Braves are ready to learn all about that beginning in spring training. And for his part, Murphy said that Olsen's description pretty much fits him to a T. Yeah, uh, that's exactly how I would describe myself. Uh, you know, some people say I'm an old soul or whatever, but uh, I agree with that. I have old man tendencies. Uh, I do like my crossword and my coffee in the morning. Uh, so I take that as a compliment no matter what he says. 
As for those rules changes, yeah, it'll be an adjustment, but Murphy doesn't believe it's going to throw that many guys off. We're just going to keep an eye on it in spring training, see who may or may not have an issue with it. I think a lot of guys will adjust fine on their own, and there might be a few guys that need a reminder. Just a little, hey, you know, speed it up, watch the clock kind of thing. I think all that will get squared away in spring training. So maybe there might be some, some stumbles early on, but I don't see it being an issue. While the pitch clock seems to be one of the easier adjustments, the lack of pickoff throws is going to be something everyone's watching to see what effect it has on the running game for all teams across Major League Baseball. Murphy said they'll try to find the best ways to mitigate that, and if it comes down to it, throwing runners out is something he's there to do. We're going to have to be creative. Uh, I think times to home are going to be more important, especially with the limited number of picks. We can't throw over a bunch of times to keep a guy honest. So I think keeping guys quick to home is going to be the best you know, form of control in the running game because you, know, you don't want to blow your pickoffs and then you give a guy a free shot at second base. So again, we'll see how this affects things. Action on the bases is always fun. I know I like it when I'm watching the game and that kind of cat and mouse thing is happening. So hopefully we get more of that, more action on the bases, more guys trying to steal. Uh, I think that's good for everybody. That's new Braves catcher Sean Murphy talking back at FanFest. And I got a chance to go down to spring training and watch this guy in action behind the plate. And I can tell you, I mean, you talk about a cannon and somebody that really enjoys throwing. Sean Murphy is that guy. And we're going to see exactly how good he can be as a stolen base deterrent for the Braves in 2023. That's a look. At the Atlanta Catchers, Travis Darno and Sean Murphy. If you want that full episode, go check out From the Diamond wherever you get your podcast. Taking a look around the league with more of our From the Diamond with Graham McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Welcome back to From the Diamond right here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Grant McCauley with you from the Kia Studios in Midtown as we continue to count down for opening day. This is the time of year that a lot of folks are not only getting ready for that, not only buying their tickets and those parking passes and all that good stuff, they're getting ready for their fantasy baseball draft. So I want to turn our focus to that for just a little while here. I want to welcome in DJ Short. He's the manager of fantasy baseball content for Roto World and NBC Sports. He's on Twitter at DJ Short. Also has a great podcast, Circling the Bases. Check that out. It comes your way twice a week. Well, DJ, great to sit down with you and talk to you because it really signals for me one of the best times of year. That, of course, is baseball season. Spring training games have started, which means that fantasy baseball is also in the offing. And, of course, a lot of people looking to get those drafts started sooner than later. So uh, with the coming of this type of year, I think that for folks, whether they've just dabbled in fantasy baseball just for fun, whether they're ultra-serious competitors who have uh, big money leagues or dynasty leagues or whatever it may be, uh, one thing that I think separates, you know, the winners and the losers in this sport and pretty much every other one seems to be preparation. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, you want to go into a draft with a plan. I, I think the thing, and this is going back to when I played like fantasy football, for example, you walk in, you don't know the players who are injured. And there's a reason those players are <laughs> sitting on the board longer than they should be. Uh-huh. Uh, so even if it's just as simple as following some of the current events, but, you know, ideally, if you want to leg up on your competition, Go to rotoworld.com, first of all. But yep. uh, you want to start to do your own research. Yes, usually, you know, depending if you're drafting on Yahoo or CBS, they have a, a certain pre-draft rankings, which are very helpful. But you may have your own tendencies. You might be in a league with friends where you know there's two Red Sox fans in there. There's mm-hmm. a Yankees fan in there. And you can use that knowledge to your advantage. So uh, just those little prep points can certainly help. Yeah, as you may know, doing my show down in Atlanta, covering the Braves for a very long time, and locally, my fantasy baseball roots are also deep in Atlanta and Braves country, so people will put a premium on those local players, Mm -hmm. their favorite players, all of those things. Good to know that as far as the tendencies of who you're playing with and against. It'll help you on draft day. It might just help you pull off a big trade in the middle of the season, too. So Mm -hmm. different leagues, different draft strategies. Uh, One that took me a while to get into, but I don't think I ever want to go back to the other way, is the auction or salary cap style format. Strategies are going to vary wildly from league type and and from this type of draft to a standard snake draft. But I think this one, it just is the most fun because everything can kind of be thrown out the window just depending on who is up for bid. Yeah, so the the difference between a standard snake draft and an auction or salary cap league is really if you want a certain player, you can get them Mm -hmm. within, within your budget, of course. But if you're saying to yourself, I'm going to get Ronald Acuna Jr. this year, no matter the price. You can do that. Whereas in a snake draft, if you're drafting 11th and that was the random number that you got, obviously you have no chance of getting Acuna. So yeah. I think that's that's a big advantage. But it's also 
playing the room a little bit. Maybe you put a player up for bid that you don't necessarily want, but some, and then maybe uh, you help boost your fellow drafters price and make them spend more out of their budget. So there's mm -hmm. lots of ways that you can play the game inside the game that makes it a lot of fun. Yeah, I love the game inside the game, and I am known to throw out some players that somebody else might really, really want and yeah. hoping that they will just go ahead and spend their money so that I can then go around and find all the deals because who doesn't like a yes. good deal? So, uh, you know, yes. the, the auction or salary cap style has just been a lot more fun for me than that snake draft mm -hmm. because there's nothing worse than signing into that room and being number 12 out of 12 in a 12-team league and knowing that you're not getting close to any of the top talents in baseball. But you can still draft smart. Yes. You can still win that league. But, man, it just – I always felt like it was just I was getting dealt from the bottom of the deck. No fun at all. Talking to DJ Short, right. manager of fantasy baseball content over at Roto World and NBC Sports. Make sure you're following him on Twitter at DJ Shorts, where you can find him and his great podcast, Circling the Bases. That's out twice a week wherever you get your podcast. Give you the great fantasy insight all season long. So uh, let's talk about the players because we can jump online and get lost, especially this time of year, in all of the content and that you know all too well. Have that big watch list of players that maybe we have in mind, and then there's magazines, articles, websites, all that stuff is devoted to ranking it all for us. As you get into this time of year and with you know your job of really cultivating that kind of content, what kind of things are you focused on as everyone readies themselves for their big draft day? For me, I think there's a big difference between drafting early in March and later in March. And, and usually that comes down to prospects who may be on the rise. Mm -hmm. uh, Jordan Walker with the Cardinals is a good example. Yeah. So if you drafted today, you could probably get Jordan Walker in the late rounds of a draft. But if you draft three weeks from now and he continues to tear the cover off the ball, he could push top 150, maybe close to top 100 if the hype is high enough. So there's advantages to drafting early. There's also disadvantages to drafting early. If a pitcher gets hurt, there's even more of a concern of that this year because of the World Baseball Classic. Yeah. These players ramping up maybe uh, high effort, high stress innings, more possibility of that occurring. If you draft early and you get a, you know an injured ace, obviously that stinks. But there are advantages to drafting early as well. So it's it's always fascinating to see that dichotomy take place. Most definitely. Now, as we talk about players at the top of drafts, and I want to talk about prospects a little bit more later, but Shohei Otani is is not only unique in the real world, but he's an unheard of fantasy weapon, I would imagine. Yeah. If you're going to go 1-1 one, one in a draft, is there really a strong case to take anyone other than Otani? And if so, who and what is that case at this point? It's so weird to talk about Shohei Otani. I mean, he is a unicorn in real life yeah. and in fantasy, like you were saying. And what makes Otani so strange in the fantasy world is that each website seemingly has different rules for how to utilize him. In Yahoo, for example, there's a pitcher Otani and a hitter Otani. They're yeah. two separate players that you draft. In some leagues, and let's say it's a weekly format, you could draft one Shohei Otani, the pitcher and the hitter in one. But for any given week, you'd have to decide, am I going to use Otani as a pitcher or hitter for this week? That makes it a little harder. So for me, I think the hitter Otani, like let's just say they're two separate players. Mm -hmm. Hitter Otani will go late in the first round. Uh, just because you look at the top of the board, there's just more dynamic players available from a power and speed perspective. And that's generally what you're looking for in the top of the first round. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a Trey Turner. It's a Ronald Lacuna Jr., assuming he bounces back. It's a Julio Rodriguez, what yeah. we will see in his first full season. And even an Aaron Judge with the power advantage that he gives you. Jose Ramirez is in that group too. So for me, I think Otani, probably late first round, even in that weekly type of league where you have to be forced to make that decision, it makes him a little less appealing than it might seem. Well, his teammate Mike Trout is now the off-injured Mike Trout, and it really pains me to have to say that because I yeah. want to see that change. I feel like we're kind of getting robbed of some of the prime years of one of the greatest players that we're ever going to see, but we have no control over that, of course. So how much caution should one have in drafting him at or near the top these days because nostalgia runs deep, especially in baseball. Trout, when he's healthy, is no doubt a game-changer, but when he's healthy has been a lot less frequent the last few years. Right. It has been interesting to see uh, the reaction when we'll put out some social posts at Roto World and we'll have Mike Trout a little lower than we're accustomed to seeing him. Yeah. And the reaction is like, why would you do that? But uh, as much as we love Mike Trout, the health is a factor. We, mm -hmm. we know that uh, 36 games in 2021, 119 games in, in 2022 uh, last season. Uh, and he doesn't run anymore. And that is a key yeah 
factor and what made him so uh, dynamic and uh, important in fantasy for so long. Just four stolen bases dating back to the start of 2020. So when he's healthy, he's on the field. He's the best player in baseball. But if he's not going to run, he just can't hang with some of those uh you know, top of the first rounder type players. Yeah, the guys that fill up all the columns. Trout still does a ton, even not running. But there was that time, whether it was, you know, Barry Bonds or Sammy Sosa, King Griffey Jr. I mean, a lot of these guys, they ran a lot more in their youth. And then for various reasons, they stopped running as they got older. And, uh, of course, we know Father Time is undefeated as well. It's Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. This is from the Dymo Grant McCauley. I'm chatting with DJ Short, the manager of fantasy baseball content over at Roto World and NBC Sports. Talking about the top of your fantasy draft, because I'm sure for a lot of people out there listening, it's kind of top of mind right now. We've gone over Otani, and we've talked about his teammate Mike Trout, who historically has been a 1-1 kind of a pick, but look, we saw what Aaron Judge did last year. He won the MVP award. This dude is a monster. Is he kind of the other 1-1 lock, or do you have other players that could sneak into that overall top pick in your fantasy draft here in 2023? So I recently did a top fantasy outfielders podcast, and I put Aaron Judge first. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though he might not run as much as some of these other guys, he did steal 16 bases last season. That's, I I think, partially because he was just on base so much, at least when he wasn't hitting the ball out of the ballpark, uh, that is. But what you really look at last year with Aaron Judge was the home run advantage he had over everyone else. I believe he had 16 more home runs than any other hitter in Major League Baseball. That advantage that he gives you is huge. Is he going to hit 62 home runs again? Probably not. But for me, I'm setting my baseline expectations at 40, 45 home runs. Who else can you really say that with going into this year? So even though he doesn't run as much as some of those other guys, you know, stayed in Yan- stay with the Yankees, going to be in that favorable ballpark. To me, he's has a very strong argument to be number one, but I think it is a bit wide open this year. Talking some fantasy baseball with DJ Short of Roto World. I want to do a little rapid fire with a few Braves players yeah. because I'm sure that local flavor is something guys are looking to, or should I say, players are looking to sprinkle into their fantasy baseball team. So Ronald Acuna Jr. clearly wasn't himself in 2022. Yeah. Uh, 2023, though, could be a different story. I got to see him at spring training for about a week and a half. Things are looking awfully good, and I don't even want to say you know that I have to put a disclaimer on it, but his knee has not been a talking point this spring. He has looked like the mm. player who he was before that ACL tear that ended his year in 2021 and kind of hobbled him last year. Do you buy into a revenge tour for Ronald Acuna Jr.? And if you're buying in, how high are you on him this year? Yeah, I mean, I've seen him go number one in a lot of fantasy drafts, and it, it's hard for me to really argue with it. I mean, certainly last year he didn't look like himself, like you said. Uh, And you could tell by if you go on Baseball Savant and you look at sprint speed, Mm -hmm. like he just he wasn't himself. We know that. But if a full year removed from that surgery, some extra time in the offseason to heal, uh, I I think you should be very optimistic about him. And even though he dropped off a bit last year and and pretty much everything as far as quality of contact, he still hit the ball extremely hard. So I think there's lots of reason for optimism for Acuna, and there's a reason he's going so early in fantasy drafts. So I think Braves fans should feel very good about a resurgence from Acuna this year. Now around these parts, we don't talk about Ronald Acuna Jr. without bringing up his buddy Ozzie Albies, who has an offensive profile that a lot of second basemen would love to have in terms of extra base hits and run production, all those things. On base may be a little bit lower than some, but boy, he makes up for it by putting up some serious production when he is healthy. But he kind of had a lost year in 2022. How much of a value play could Ozzie Albies be in the middle to maybe even later rounds if people are just kind of overlooking him or seeing where he might be ranked based off of last year's production? Yeah, I think this might be the lowest you could get Ozzie Albies for a while, uh, certainly with what he's capable of doing. I I do think it was interesting to hear this week, this was the first time I heard that he had an off-season shoulder surgery. Yeah, me too. But it doesn't seem... It doesn't seem like it's really impacted anything as far as his readiness for opening day. And last year, it's, you know, we give him what we call a mulligan for the most part. I'm not really looking a lot at a lot of what happened last season. I'm looking at what he's done in previous seasons. And I'm also looking at the second base position in general in fantasy, which is not very strong. So I think he does have a chance to be a value uh, going into this season, into this season, certainly in a Braves lineup, which Top to bottom is one of the best in the majors. All right, let's wrap it up here with this question. This is from the Diamond on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Grant McCauley chatting with DJ Short of Roto World. 
Michael Harris, Spencer Strider. They exploded onto the scene last year. Any worries or reservations that you have about both of these guys in their sophomore seasons, or do you expect more of the same or possibly even bigger from both these guys? So I think the question uh, with Michael Harris uh, specifically is what progress can he make with his approach? I think that's the one thing uh, that he needs to get under control to really make that next step forward, not only as a real life player, but in fantasy as well. I think there's some questions to answer there, but uh, he's going very high in fantasy drafts. So uh, to meet that average draft position, he has to at least duplicate what he did last year or maybe maybe even exceed it. Not saying he can't do that. Yeah. And certainly given how young he is, there's plenty of time for her to, from him to hone in on that approach and improve. I think there's a lot to be excited about there uh, with Harris. And as far as Strider is concerned, obviously finished last season with that uh, lat injury, was it? Um, toward the end of the regular season yeah. last year. But uh, if you look at what he did last year, I believe he was the fastest pitcher ever to get to 200 strikeouts in a season. Uh, beat out Randy Johnson for mm -hmm. that number, which is pretty incredible to do what he did. And I can't really poke holes in anything that he did last season. Uh, sort of like Harris, though, he's going extremely early in fantasy drafts. He's already being drafted as a top 10 fantasy starter. Wow. And I think the reason for that is because you look at what he threw last year, what he threw, 131 innings, something mm -hmm. like that. But if he can push that to 160, let's just say 170, he could strike out 230 batters and be a real difference maker in fantasy leagues. You know the wins are going to be there with a quality Braves team. So I think the ADP, again, it's going to be tough to match, but he certainly has that talent and upside to do that. Well, those are just a handful of the players I wanted to get to on this edition of From the Diamond. But, DJ, I'd love to have you back throughout the season so we could talk about a few more, even in the March to opening day, what people are drafting. And then, of course, you got to play the 162 if you want to win your league. So would love to have you back again and continue chatting about this throughout the season. Sounds great. Let's do it. All right. He's DJ Short, manager of fantasy baseball content for NBC Sports and Roto World. Follow him on Twitter at DJ Short and check out his podcast, Circling the Bases. It comes your way twice a week. It'll give you all that good fantasy content that you are looking for. A lot more Braves talk coming up here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Baseball. Talking Braves and beyond. Baseball. With From the Diamond, Sports Radio 92.9, The Game. And welcome back into From the Diamond as we wrap up this week's show. And what a show it's been. We packed in a lot of stuff. You've heard from several members of the Atlanta Braves, including my spring training conversations with Max Reed and with Kyle Wright. And you can find every episode of From the Diamond wherever you get your podcast. So make sure you're subscribed, leave a rating and a review. That definitely helps out the show quite a bit. So if you wouldn't mind doing that while you're there. And if you missed anything on the show, it's always available for you there in the Odyssey app. So be sure to check that out. This is From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, live from the Kia Studios as we wrap up this weekend. And we look ahead to this week for not just the Atlanta Braves, but all of Major League Baseball, there's a little thing called the World Baseball Classic that's back again for the first time in quite a while. I think the pandemic pushed everything back a little bit in terms of when they felt like they were going to be able to pull off this old WBC thing again. But uh, we got some stacked rosters. We got a lot of stuff going on. A couple of key members of the Atlanta Braves who are going to be participating for their clubs in the WBC that we'll talk about a little bit uh, as we go on here. But um, with this happening, we want to talk a little bit about what you need to know about baseball's what I'll call international showcase. and when everything is happening, which, by the way, is going to be soon. Ronald Acuna Jr. heading out to join Team Venezuela. Eddie Rosario going to be on the Puerto Rico team. Chadwick Tromp is going to be playing for the Netherlands. And Alan Rangel, who is a Braves reliever, will be pitching for the Team Mexico squad. Not a lot beyond that. It's kind of surprising. I mean, former Brave Freddie Freeman is going to be part of the Canadian squad. Uh, but it's never really been, I think, after the first one, when you had Chipper Jones and Brian McCann and some others, uh, not been a whole lot on Team USA, but there is, however, a former Brave managing Team USA, and I had the opportunity to talk to him a little bit earlier this winter. He is former infielder Mark DeRosa, who you may see these days on MLB Network. He's there quite a bit, does a lot of great stuff, and I was able to catch up with him on Battery Power, which, by the way, is a show I host with Corey McCartney. You can find it on YouTube. Please subscribe over there and uh, throw us all your uh, comments and accolades and uh, whatnot if you'd like to, but uh, just more Braves content for you anyway. And the opportunity to speak to Mark DeRosa I thought was a lot of fun because, yeah, we talked some hot stove and whatnot, but we really wanted to 
get his input on or, or, or take on what's going to be his first managerial job of his career. So when you look at the World Baseball Classic as opposed to a regular old 162-game regular season type job, yeah, it's going to be a little bit different because your roster is stacked full of superstars in the case of Team USA. So I asked Mark DeRosa, what is his biggest challenge managing this USA squad in the WBC? Here's what he said. Yeah, I think biggest challenge will be getting them to come together as a team, I mean, super quick. That will be the biggest challenge for me. I think... Paul Seiler, kind of the head of USA Baseball, has a great line. He said, it's not an exhibition, it's a competition. I think we went in, like you said, I played in 09 with Chipper and Brian McCann. We went in, and it was kind of new. I think it was the second or third time they had done it. And we went in and kind of like, whoa. We didn't realize we were walking into divisional playoff games three weeks into spring training. So I think it was a wake-up call. I think it has since changed and grown a lot bigger where these guys are prepared to come in in uh, a little bit different shape. Maybe the pitchers weren't as ready back in 09 as maybe these guys come in a little bit hotter, ready to go. So I think that's the biggest thing for me. Try and create a clubhouse and a room that they feel completely comfortable in right out of the gate because it's going to be awkward for a lot of these guys, right? For them to walk in out of three weeks out of spring training and be amongst some of the game's greats. So how do they get comfortable? And how is it a seamless transition to getting them to buy in the team and competing like right out of the shoot? Yeah, I think that's going to be. I mean, when you talk about just getting a club to come together over the course of a long season, you know, you you find the chemistry and the personality of that club year to year. It can vary, even if you've got a lot of the same guys back. But this is taking stars and, and good players and great players from uh, all kinds of different teams and just throwing them together for a couple of weeks and seeing if you can win a title of some sort, and that has in and of itself its own challenges. And then you talk about the national pride that a lot of these clubs, I mean, I'll talk about the Dominican Republic team here in a little while because that is a club that's going to be hard to contend with. But Team USA, I would say, is is built pretty well. They have a good, I would say, pitching staff. I don't know if it's the greatest, but when you start to look at it, it's definitely solid. They've got some really good starters and relievers, a nice mix here. The veteran Adam Wainwright is on this club. Uh, you've got also uh, Merrill Kelly, Lance Lynn among the starting pitchers, Miles Michaelis, and then you've got a handful of relievers, I think, that should you know keep Team USA in most games. But the strength of this club, just start looking at this offense. You've got JT Ramuto and Will Smith behind the plate for this. Pete Alonso, Tim Anderson, Nolan Arenado, Paul Goldschmidt, Trey Turner, Bobby Wood Jr. Then you go to the outfield, Mookie Betts. Uh, you got Cedric Mullins along with Kyle Schwarber. Some guy named Mike Trout. Also, Kyle Tucker, Jeff McNeil. I mean, it's a pretty good club. And then I started looking at this coaching staff, and this is impressive because not just is Mark DeRosa going to be managing this. He's going to have his bench coach, his old buddy, the former Brave Brian McCann. Uh, Then there are a couple other uh, very interesting um, coaching additions to this club. Hitting coach, Ken Griffey Jr. That's not a bad name to pull out of uh, your stack of baseball cards to be your hitting coach uh, for this Team USA club. Andy Pettit as well as Dave Rigetti, Michael Young, also on this uh, coaching staff. So it's star-studded all the way across the board. But uh, when you think about Mark DeRosa's career, I mean, he played for a lot of different teams, but he also played for some of the best managers you could possibly play for. He began his career playing for Bobby Cox, also under Bruce Bochy, Buck Showalter. I mean, the list goes on for this guy. So one of the things I wanted to know was, what does that experience throughout your career of playing for some of these great managers, what does that lend itself to when it comes to you being a manager for the very first time? I take a little bit from each of them and I take what I like. I mean, what I like is brutal honesty, but backed up in fact, right? Bobby Cox was the best at telling you the worst things about what he thought about you and your playing ability, but you left that meeting wanting to still run through a wall for the guy. And those meetings changed. Do you have the ability to change it? I don't think in three weeks with the WBC, I'm going to have to deal with any of that. These guys know coming in who's starting and, you know, I I actually have the list in front of me. It's, I mean, Goldie and Alonzo, they'll switch on and off until we figure out in Miami or hopefully when we do get to Miami and get into the, to real tough games, you got to go with the hot hand. I think everybody is on board with that. So just super excited for the opportunity, kind of trying to figure out, trying to piece together a pitching staff. That's been kind of, a little bit difficult because, I mean, would you love Max Freed? Now you got to get the Braves to sign off on it. So, you know, the guys we want to take the bump don't necessarily get the chance to take the bump. 
And then you kind of got to work your way through that. But from a total team standpoint, when it's all said and done, we'll have as good a chance as anybody. I think they are going to have a very good chance. You look at this, you mentioned Miami. That's, of course, where the semifinals and the finals are going to be. In addition to the play for Pool D, USA finds itself in its first round with a pool that includes Mexico, Colombia, Canada, and there are some qualifiers. I'm not going to get all bogged down in that, but there are some other countries that are looking to jump into each one of these pools, and they'll be playing these qualifier tournaments, and then they'll round out. There's A, B, C, and D uh, as far as the pools are concerned. Uh, Pool D is going to be happening in Miami. It's Puerto Rico, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, Israel, and one of the qualifier teams. And again, Good luck trying to get through that pool because if you can get through a Venezuela or Puerto Rico, they're already going to be tough enough. The Dominican Republic is one of the most ridiculously stacked teams. I'll talk a little bit more about that. If you can advance through that first round, you'll get to the quarterfinals, which are going to be happening in Miami on that side. On the other side for Pool A and B, you've got uh, uh, some of it. Pool A is playing in Taiwan, the rest of it in Tokyo, Japan. Then you would go on to play in the quarterfinals in Tokyo. And if you can advance beyond that and meet the winners of the other side quarterfinals, that both the semifinals and the championship will take place in Miami. This whole thing will wrap up March 21st. That's when the championship will be crowned. So right before opening day, I mean, we are knocking on the door. So a lot of clubs are going to be missing some key players here for a little while, but I just don't know that there's a better time or better you know, situation to try to get a thing like this played because you're not going to stop the regular season and do it. The All-Star break doesn't give you enough time, and you certainly are not going to ask guys to stick around in October and November while the playoffs are going on and try to do a World Baseball Classic tournament. Even if it's every two, three, four years, you're just not going to find a a lot of uh, selling points on that. One of the unfortunate things for Team USA, they wanted Clayton Kershaw to pitch for him. He had an insurance issue based on his injury history. He was going to put up the money to cover it if need be, but they just couldn't get it signed off on, so Kershaw was not able to join Team USA, but as I mentioned, that Dominican Republic team, um, awfully good. Sandy Alcantara is going to be leading their pitching staff. He's going to have the veteran uh, Johnny Cueto with him, among others. Uh, Christian Javier is going to be on that club, on that pitching staff. Then you start to look at that infield, which includes Rafael Deffers, Wander Franco, Manny Machado, Cattell Marte, Jeremy Pena, Gene Segura, uh, Willie Adamas, uh, and Robinson Cano. An outfield that includes Eloy Jimenez, Julio Rodriguez, Juan Soto, and Teoscar Hernandez. I mean, this is an absolutely ridiculous squad. DH is Nelson Cruz, just in case you need somebody who's hit 500 home runs to just throw in your lineup as well. Uh, So Rodney Linares, who's the manager of this club, I think going to be pretty happy with what they're going to be able to do. And again, uh, Dominican Republic is in Pool D for the World Baseball Classic. Venezuela, which is the Ronald Acuna Jr. squad, uh, also has some, uh, some very good players that are going to be on there including uh, Jose Altuve. Uh, Let's see, as you run down the list, not just Acuna, but also, let's see, some veterans like David Peralta, uh, Luis Arias, who won the batting title in the American League last year, Eduardo Escobar, won the New York Mets, Gleyber Torres, Eugenio Suarez, just a a list of very capable players, and they're going to be trying to get past that Dominican club as well. Puerto Rico has Eddie Rosario on that squad. The other brave who's involved in this uh, is Chadwick Trump, I guess, and, and Alan Ron Hell, who was a minor league reliever for the Braves, a prospect of sorts. He is on the 40-man roster. So, of course, worth a mention. Uh, one other question I had for Mark DeRosa, and just talking about the experience, the opportunity to manage uh, is something that a lot of former players look forward to. Now, you can get into broadcast, and let me just tell you, you can stay around for a long time just talking about the game, but for guys who aspire to something more that keeps them inside the game, managing is an outlet that a lot of players would love to have the opportunity to uh, you know, check that box as far as their pro career is concerned. So I asked him about his desire, perhaps in the future, to be a big league manager. Here's what Mark DeRosa, manager of Team USA in the WBC, had to say about that. It really is a tough question. I think everything's case by case scenario. I think what's held me back from really like jumping in is the fact that you have to be all in. Um, my playing career was me cast my wife and kids. It's like even though you're home, you're thinking about what you're going to do at seven o'clock that night. So I have nothing but unbelievable respect for the guys that go about it. I'm just at a place right now that with my kids and their ages and wanting to be home and be around and be a part, it's not something unless somebody blows my hair back that I'm, you know, jumping out of my couch to go do. This was a, a just an unbelievable opportunity that I felt I couldn't pass up. So when I went in, I kind of I fought hard for this one. And I can understand that because you have the opportunity to go manage a club that, again, is a star-studded team. I mean, it's headlined uh, by Mike Trout. I might have buried that lead when I went through the roster a minute ago. 
because they were in alphabetical order and I got the outfielders last. But, I mean, all jokes aside, I mean, you know the opportunity you're having to bring together what could be a very special club. And for Team USA, I mean, it took a minute, I think, to adjust to just how seriously some of these other countries were going to take winning this because, no, it's not the World Series. It doesn't have a century plus of history behind it. But very quickly, it got very competitive, and I think it's going to be competitive here again in 2023. So it will be um, Mark DeRosa managing Team USA. Again, uh, that from our interview with Mark over on Battery Power. You can find it on YouTube in its entirety. And uh, Corey McCartney and I had the opportunity to talk to Mark, and hopefully we'll be able to talk to him after this. And maybe after he's had a chance to manage, now how do you feel about maybe doing this again on a full-time variety? But, again, he's got a good thing going on MLB Network, so I don't blame him for that. But uh, great to catch up with the former Brave and get his thoughts on this WBC, which is going to be beginning March 11th. However, as we look at the week ahead for the Atlanta Braves, they've got something very interesting on the schedule down in Northport because this – uh, week in spring training, they're off on Monday, which uh, only a couple of off days from games in spring training. Then on Tuesday night, they're going to play under the lights. Then on Wednesday and Thursday, you're going to be seeing that Dominican Republic team from the WBC roll into Northport and play the Atlanta Braves at 105, and that's Wednesday. Puerto Rico, meanwhile, will come in at 107 on Thursday. So a couple of afternoon tilts against a couple of WBC teams. Uh, so it'll be Eddie Rosario, I guess, suiting up against the Atlanta Braves. Uh, come Thursday, but on that Dominican team, uh, that's going to be, I, I think, a fun one to watch and uh, a lot of, um, I, I guess, a good test for some of these WBC teams to get, get together, get all these these stars and these personalities and uh, start heading in the same direction and play a club that has had a couple of weeks to you know, get its feet under it, as the Braves have and, and most clubs have at this point in spring training. So that's going to be fascinating, uh, a lot of fun to watch that. I always enjoyed seeing, as I've got a chance to cover the very first WBC uh, down in Orlando was where one of the pools was to get things started. And there was a lot of passion and pageantry uh, for that. And you would imagine, and the first is always going to be memorable, but there have been a lot of cool moments in the WBC that I have enjoyed. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea and it's again, kind of uh, strangely scheduled in the middle of spring training, but there are a lot of moments and it gets very serious very quickly for a lot of these players. And you don't usually think about very serious, ultra competitive baseball happening in the middle of March, but you might just find some in the WBC. That'll wrap things up here on this edition of From the Diamond. Appreciate you coming along for the ride with me. I'll be here with you each and every Sunday. Dom, as always, I appreciate all your help. Also appreciate my guests on this show, Carlos Colazzo of Baseball America, as well as DJ Short of Roto World. Definitely enjoyed chatting with them. If you missed anything, you can find it on the podcast, and you can find From the Diamond wherever you get your podcasts. That'll wrap things up here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley. For this week, I will catch you next Sunday on 92.9 The Game. Until then, so long, everyone.